Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to our monthly webinars. This is part of the Anteater Sloth and Armadillo Specialist Group, where we talk all about xenarthrins and their conservation. We have lots of websites and social media going on. Our main website is xenarthrins.org. We're also active on Instagram right now. We have our Facebook page. And then we have a brand new YouTube channel where you can like and subscribe for more Sinarthrin content. If you are on Facebook or if you go to our brand new page on Sinarthrins.org, you will see a list of upcoming webinars. If you click that you're going, then you'll get a friendly reminder. If you can't attend live, they will be published on our YouTube and our Facebook channels about five days after the live event. Well, one of the benefits of attending live is you get to ask the experts questions. If you feel inspired by the support that our specialist group does, you can go to our website and click the donate button to help with conservation. And like I mentioned, if you're here live, if you go to the bottom of your screen, it says chat, you can type in your questions here. And then at the end of Jim's presentation, I will collate them and then ask him the best questions at the end. Welcome to what I guess is the, this, this is the, uh, from what I understand, the first webinar hosted by the specialist group. Seems like there's going to be quite a few more. Um, my name is, as Kenny said, is Jim Lockery. I'm a professor in the Department of of biology at Valdosta State. I've been a member of the uh, specialist group for, I guess, about 25 years or so now. And what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight uh, is some of the work that my wife and I, my wife is Colleen McDonough, who's also a professor of biology at Valdosta State, also a member of the specialist group. Uh, but we've done a lot of research on the nine banded armadillo. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit about that uh, this evening. This first slide is sort of my public service announcement kind of slide here. At least in the United States, a lot of times you see armadillos just flattened on the road. And so perhaps the reason why is what you see on the left there. So the take home message there is if you're going to drink, stay off the road. So I have done my, my bit for public service for the day. All right, now to get into things a little bit, you know, I know that it's kind of a diverse audience. So for those of you that already are in the specialist group or, or know something about xenarthrins, this is gonna seem a little remedial. Uh, so just bear with me, but I didn't know exactly who would know what. So I thought I would start by just uh, explaining what an armadillo is. And if we were going to get medieval about this, uh, 400 years or so ago, I would have told you that an armadillo was a turtle. Because when the uh, early Europeans were colonizing the Americas, the carapace of an armadillo resembled to them the shell of a turtle. And so they considered them to be uh, related to one another. Uh, we now know that that's not true. Uh, armadillos are mammals. They're like us. They have hair. They, uh, they give live birth, they don't lay eggs, they nurse their young, so they're mammals just like us. And they belong to a group called Xenarthra. This is kind of a technical point, but the name Xenarthra comes from a, a little bony process that's found in the lower vertebrae of Xenarthrans, which no other mammals have. And it's thought to maybe strengthen the lower back, perhaps as an adaptation for digging. But no other mammals have this. And so that makes uh, anatomically the xenarthrin, uh, xenarthrins, I should say, uh, really unique. The xenarthra is split into two basic groups. One of the groups is the cingulata, which consists of the armadillos and their relatives. That's what I'm going to be talking about this evening. The other group is pilosa which if you've looked at the specialist group website, you probably already know, 
consists of uh, two groups of organisms. One would be the vermilingua, which are the anteaters, and then the filivora, which are the sloths. Perhaps in further webinars, I, I think, in fact, from what I've seen, you're going to hear some about anteaters and sloths. So you can learn more about them uh, in a few weeks or so. But what I'm going to talk about today concerns armadillos. Now, Singulata uh, consists of the armadillos, but it also consists of some other groups as well. Uh, in fact, there are four basic groups of Singulata, and two of them are extinct, which look a lot like modern armadillos. They were bigger for the most part, but they had a carapace. They had the flexible bands, uh, much like a lot of modern, like all modern armadillos do. In addition to the pampathirs, we also had the glypodon uh, glyptodonts, rather which were huge. Uh, this is a photograph from a display at the American Museum of Natural History. And the glyptodon is in the back. In the forefront, you have some, uh, at least on the, on the left and the right, you have modern armadillos. You can see glyptodons were huge. And not only that, but unlike pamphetheres, glyptodons had a fused carapace that was relatively rigid. They're all gone now. Uh, the ones that we still have occurring on the planet at this point consist of two groups, one of which are the long-nosed armadillos in the, the uh, family Desipodidae. This is the one I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, subsequently, this is where the long, or the nine-banded armadillo uh, resides. It's in the Desipodidae. That in fact is a nine-banded armadillo in the photograph. And then you have a whole series of other armadillos in the group uh, Clemphoridae, which includes things like the fairy armadillo, the three-banded armadillo, the giant armadillo, and the six-banded species. But we're going to be focusing on the long-nosed armadillos in the group Desipodidae. So if we further break that group down just a little bit more, Within the long-nosed armadillos, if we were doing this talk, say, five years or so ago, I would have told you there are seven species of long-nosed armadillo, and these are pictures of each one of them. Uh, in the last five years, though, things have, have been uh, proposed to be a little bit different. There have been some proposed rearrangements some of which are still controversial. Some, I think, have been relatively well accepted. This is all based on work by uh, someone, uh, someone named Anderson Feijo, who's at the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences currently. Uh, but what he has proposed is that uh, this one species, Dazipus caplaride, one of the, the biggest, actually, long-nosed armadillo, is, in fact, three different species. I don't have pictures of them, but he thinks there are three different ones found in different parts of South America. And conversely, he's argued that uh, these three species that we used to recognize as being distinct may in fact be uh, various subspecies of the seven-banded armadillo, Dazipus septumcinctus. I'm not gonna have anything more to say about this. Just uh, the only point in bringing this up is to make you aware that the taxonomy of those is currently in flux. And if anybody is going to want to ask me a question at the end of the uh, webinar, my answer is I don't know because I don't think anybody knows at this point. But um, with any luck, we'll try and figure things out in the next couple of years. But uh, there is some controversy right now about exactly what is out there. Now, for the rest of the talk, we're going to focus the spotlight specifically on Gazipus novum sanctus, which is the Latin name for the nine-banded armadillo, which Colleen and I love and adore. Uh, it is a species we worked on for over 30 years. So 
we have spent a lot of time studying these animals. And so if I tell you a little bit about nine-banded armadillos, uh, first, just some basic facts. Uh, they're relatively small. They're, they're at best medium-sized mammals. They typically weigh about three and a half to four and a half kilograms. Uh, some can be bigger, some can be smaller. Uh, length is uh, somewhere between about 36 to 57 centimeters without the tail. If you include the tail, the tail adds another 26 to 45 uh, centimeters. Like most armadillos, like most, uh, most fossil armadillos as well, they eat mostly insects. In the case of nine-banded armadillos, it's a lot of ants, uh, beetles, termites, things like that. Uh, they're found primarily, you know, there are exceptions, but primarily in bottomland hardwood forests. The key here, which I'll talk a little bit more about uh, in just a bit, is bottomland forests are found near water. And as you can see from the photograph, contrary to what a lot of people think, uh, armadillo, nine banded armadillos at least, are not desert animals. They're not found in arid environments. Instead, they're found in areas with water because they need fresh water to survive. And so you find them in areas where there are streams, rivers, lakes, things like that. And adjacent to those bodies of water are these bottomland forests, which is where you most commonly see them. You can find them other places, but that's the best place to look. Uh, they are primarily nocturnal. So around sunset, uh, they start to become active. They are fossorial, which all, only means that they dig burrows. So they sleep during the day in their burrows. They emerge from their burrows around sunset. And when they emerge from their burrows, they go out and dig in the soil looking for insects to eat. Now, in the case of the nine-banded armadillo, it is the xenarthrin, not just the, uh, an armadillo, but the, uh, the xenarthrin with the largest geogra uh, geographic distribution. It's found from Northern Argentina all the way up to the Southern United States. So very large distribution. All of the others in Arthrans are typically confined to just portions of either Central or South America. But the nine banded armadillo has been very success, uh, successful for whatever reason and is found uh, throughout the Americas. Now with such a broad range, uh, probably not too surprising. There are several different subspecies of nine-banded armadillo that have been recognized. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but getting back to the taxonomic issues that I mentioned earlier, it's sort of uh, debatable right now, or it's, it's uh, not clear uh, just how legitimate some of these subspecies de uh, designations are and whether they should still be uh, used. But there have been some genetic studies that suggest that at least some populations are distinct enough that instead of being subspecies, they might even be considered to be a separate species. For example, the species found, uh, or the populations rather, found here in the Guyanan Shield in Northern South America in this area. Uh, they seem to be genetically distinct enough that they might be a separate species. At this point, nobody has formally uh, proposed that or named them as a separate species. So for the time being, we consider them as nine-banded armadillos. But just like with a lot of the taxonomy of nine-banded armadillos, things seem to be in flux and things could be changing in the near future. So we'll see what happens. Regarding the distribution of nine-banded armadillos, I'll just mention one more thing, which is while this is the current distribution of the species from Northern Argentina all the way up to the Southern US, at least in the US, nine-banded armadillos were not there historically. They've only been in the US for about 200 years or so. If you look at the colonization of the United States by nine banded armadillos, it occurred in two phases. 
John James Audubon reported nine banded armadillos in the, in the 1820s or 1830s. As there was more European colonization of Texas, and especially with the uh, implementation of agriculture, armadillos, you know, whether it was cause and effect or not, I don't think anybody knows, but coincident with European colonization and the introduction of agriculture into Texas, nine banded armadillos moved out of the Rio Grande Valley and started to move north and east. So they moved up through the rest of Texas, up into Oklahoma. They moved into Louisiana, into Mississippi, over into Alabama. And then in the 1920s, there were one or more releases of captive armadillos in South Central Florida. So somewhere down in this region here. Uh, the stories vary whether that was intentional releases or accidental, but one way or the other, uh, they got out and they began to colonize Florida. And descendants of those animals eventually colonized most of Florida except for the Okefenokee, although <clears throat> these days I believe they actually are in the Okefenokee, but they moved northward and ultimately westward as well. And by the 1970s, the Eastern Florida population had merged with the Western Texas derived animals. So that the geographic distribution of nine banded armadillos in the US nowadays looks like this. They're found throughout the Southern United States. And in fact, this map is a little bit outdated because they're found all the way through uh, there are sightings of armadillos in every part of Tennessee now. Apparently they get up into some portions of North Carolina as well. Uh, they're up into beyond Southern Illinois, maybe up into Central Illinois, uh, Southern Indiana. So they're continuing to expand their range. And this range expansion has become sort of a, one of the, the poster children for climate change because the argument about why armadillos have been able to expand northward like this is that the higher temperatures uh, associated with global warming have allowed them to, to be able to colonize these more northern areas. Uh, I'll come back to this in a little bit, uh, but to explain that a little bit further, all xenarthrins, not just armadillos, but sloths and anteaters as well, have extremely low metabolic rates uh, for an animal, for a mammal of their body size. And so they don't thermoregulate very well. And because of that, the traditional, the classical thinking was that armadillos couldn't survive in areas that were consistently cold because they wouldn't be able to tolerate those cold environments and they would die. Uh, but with global warming, heating everything up and making the warmer, uh, the winters rather milder, the thinking is that they're able to colonize areas that they otherwise wouldn't have. But while that may be true, there's a little bit more to the story because even though the range is expanding northward, you'll notice that it's really not expanding to the west. And this gets back to something I mentioned earlier. Most of the western US is too arid. There's not enough water. So Armadillos can't survive in those kinds of habitats. They need to have water to survive so they can survive in the east and the potentially the northeast because there is plenty of water available. And so the combination of water availability and mild temperature will ultimately, at least we think now, ultimately determine exactly how far the range expan uh, expansion goes. But it is a dynamic process. This is not a final picture where this is where armadillos are and, and that's it. Uh, this is an ongoing process where uh, we're going to continue to be updating this because armadillos are continuing to expand into other parts of the US. Now, having said all of that, I want to get more to the main thing that I want to talk about uh, today, which is that there are two, uh, two primary unique features of nine banded armadillos. 
And the first of these I'm not going to talk any more about today. That would be a whole nother webinar. So if this goes well, maybe I'll do another one at some point. Uh, but one of the things that nine banded armadillos do, which is extremely unusual, is something called polyembryonic. Poly just means many. So you're producing many embryos. And the key thing about that is that you're producing many embryos from a single fertilized egg. This is something that apparently all of the long-nosed armadillos do. So not just nine-banded armadillos, but the other ones that I showed you earlier as well. Uh, what happens during the breeding season is that a female will produce a single, or she will ovulate a single egg. And if that egg gets fertilized, then when it implants in the uterus to begin embryonic development, at the start of that developmental process, it splits in two, and those two cells separate. And then those two cells split again to create four separate embryos. And because they're all derived from an initial uh, single fertilized egg, all of those embryos are genetically identical. So in nine-banded armadillos, females give birth to litters of genetically identical quadruplets. So each litter has to be all male or all female, and they are genetically identical to one another. Now, the other long-nosed armadillos don't necessarily give birth to litters of four. There's one species that gives birth to litters of eight or 12, and the others give birth to other numbers. But the current thinking anyway is that they all are producing these multiple offspring from a single fertilized egg. And there's been a lot of interest in trying to figure out what the consequences of that are. You know, how does that impact armadillo populations, their behavior, their ecology? And Colleen and I spent a good decade trying to figure that out in nine-banded armadillos. Um, and so if I do another webinar, I'd be happy to tell you all about that. But for today, I'm going to talk about something that uh, people seem to be more interested in because it has more direct impacts on human beings, which is that nine-banded arm uh, nine armadillos get leprosy. Sorry. Ah, there we go. And so this is what I'm going to talk about for the rest of this webinar. But before I do, whether you're talking about leprosy or or polyembryonic or anything else about the biology of armadillos. I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of how we managed to collect the data to be able to say anything about any of those topics. And so, as you already know, armadillos are nocturnal. So we have to go out in the evenings and the way that we catch them is with a dip net so it's not rocket science here. We just walk around looking for animals with spotlights or headlamps. When we see one, we take the dip net and we just slam it down on the animal. When we catch the animal, we then take a series of measurements. We weigh them. We get different body size measurements. For females, we check the reproductive condition. Uh, we take a little bit of uh, ear tissue for a DNA sample. To screen them for leprosy, we clip the end of a toenail so that we can get a blood sample. And then once we've done all of that, we let them go again. So there you can finally see Colleen releasing an armadillo. Now in this photograph, you can't really see it, but before we release them, we do one other thing, which is that we super glue reflective tape onto the carapace so that uh, if we see the armadillo again, we already know who it is and we don't have to recapture it. Now, for a lot of the work that we've done, and especially for the leprosy work, in addition to catching live animals and doing the things that I've just described, uh, we've also collected a lot of roadkill, which is not pleasant work, but uh, it's useful because you can get a lot of the same data from a, a dead armadillo as you can from a live one. You can get a blood sample, you can get a DNA sample, uh, you can a lot of times get body size measurements. So they do provide an important supplement to the data that we can get from catching live animals. Now, the final thing that we do 
which we don't do when we're out trying to catch animals, we do it in the mornings when armadillos are asleep, is that we go back to the places where we've either caught an animal or, or spotted a, an animal that's already been marked. And we have a GPS unit that allows us to get its spatial location. And what that allows us to do is to actually plot all of the locations of each animal that we have detected. So over the years, we've worked in two primary places. Initially from 1992 to 2003, we worked at the Tall Timbers Research Station in uh, just north of Tallahassee in Florida. And so all those little black dots are locations of either animals that we caught or that we recited. And you can see, you can use that information to look at habitat preferences. You can look at other uh, kinds of spatial patterns. So having all this GPS information is, is really useful. And then specifically for the leprosy work, uh, we did most of that at the Yazoo National Wildlife Refuge, which is in Western Mississippi. And here, you, uh, to show you the entire site, I had to compress the map a little bit so you can't see, but the, all of those black dots, there's a lot of black dots there. They're just compressed into uh, almost what looks like a line because there were so many locations there. All right, so that's how we got the data. Let me tell you a little bit about leprosy. So as a little bit of background, leprosy is a bacterial infection. The bacterium is something called Mycobacterium leprae. And there are a few things that you need to know to understand what I'm going to be telling you. Excuse me. The first is that, you know, I said earlier that uh, the fact that armadillos have leprosy is something unique about nine-banded armadillos. The reason why it is unique is that although there are some examples in Europe and Africa of red squirrels and chimpanzees, exhibiting natural infections of leprosy. In the Americas, the only species other than humans that is known to exhibit natural infections of leprosy are nine-banded armadillos. And one of the reasons why that seems to occur is because armadillos are cool. They're very cool. And the leprosy bacterium only propagates and only generates disease at lower temperatures. This is why in humans, you typically associate leprosy with the extremities, the fingertips, the ears, the toes, because they're cooler than the rest of the body. But in nine band and armadillos, remember they have this very low metabolic rate. And so the entire body is cool. This is a uh, thermal image and it's actually misleading because what this is showing you is heat loss from the animal rather than the core temperature. And so the point here is that the entire body of the animal is releasing heat. So armadillos are cool throughout their body. And so unlike in humans where the, le uh, the leprosy bacterium can really only survive in the extremities or be effective in the extremities, in the case of nine band and armadillos, it can propagate everywhere. It can, it's systemic, it can occur anywhere in the body. So it just spreads through the, the various internal organs. Now it doesn't do that rapidly, it's a slow acting disease. But in addition to being systemic and just causing infection throughout the body, it also elevates metabolic rate and almost inevitably, if an animal is infected, it will ultimately die uh, of the infection. Now, there's two other points to make. Uh, the next point is that while armadillos do get leprosy, uh, we are the reason why they get it. Because the M. leprae, the bacterium that's found in armadillos, uh, is derived from a human source. There are various strains of the leprosy bacterium that have been identified genetically. And the strain that's found in armadillos actually is uh, from Europe. And remember, all xenarthrins, including armadillos, are strictly from the Americas. So it could not have happened that there were armadillos in Europe that came to South America and introduced the disease. 
instead during the Europe, uh, European colonization of the Americas with their African slaves, humans introduced M. leprae into the Americas and nine banded uh, nine armadillos were exposed to it and subsequently became a reservoir for the disease, for the bacterium. Now, as just a quick aside, I will point out that the things that I've said about nine banded armadillos and leprosy would actually apply to all the other armadillos as well. They all have low metabolic rates. And yet none of them show naturally occurring infections of, uh, with leprosy. And it can inoculate them with uh, the, the bacterium in the lab. And some of them will develop leprosy. But you know, to be fair, not a lot of people have looked. But to the extent that people have looked, uh, no other species of armadillo is known to, to exhibit naturally occurring infections with leprosy. So a little bit surprising, given that they have the same characteristics that seem to predispose nine-banded armadillos to having leprosy. And the final thing which I'll be talking more about on the next couple of slides is that while armadillos probably acquired leprosy from exposure to human leprosy, currently, at least in the US, uh, the armadillos that have leprosy have exactly the same strain that is found in human cases of leprosy, at least, I should say, indigenous cases of human leprosy, meaning people who developed le uh, leprosy in the US that didn't travel overseas and bring it back that actually acquired the disease in the US. So what that suggests is that there may be transmission in both directions, that while we may have given leprosy to armadillos back in the 15, 1600s, armadillos have returned the favor and have given it to us and caused certain cases of human leprosy in the US. And so extending that point, the next thing I wanted to talk about with regard to leprosy is its biogeography. And here I'm limiting myself largely to the US. Now, I don't want to get too technical here, but there have been two sets of surveys to examine the prevalence of leprosy infection in armadillos in primarily the US. The older form involved what was called a histopathological examination. And all that means is that with histopathology, you take a tissue sample and you look at it under the microscope to look for nerve damage. And in armadillos, this was traditionally done by taking uh, ear tissue because that was easy to acquire. The ears being peripheral tissue, they would be nice and cool. So you could detect the, uh, the presence of leprosy in those samples. It's time consuming. And as I'll talk about in a minute, it's not as sensitive as you might like. But beginning in the oh, late 1960s, certainly the 1970s, there were extensive surveys of armadillos, mostly in the US, but you can see there were a few other places. Now, this is a lot of numbers. I don't want you to worry about all those numbers except for a couple of things, which are that if you look at these numbers, there are a lot of armadillos that were sampled, you know, several thousand. But of all of those armadillos that were sampled, they only found cases of leprosy in just a few places. In the US, it was primarily in Louisiana and in Texas. And that was really just about it. And interestingly, if you plotted where these animals were found in those states, along with uh, indigenous human cases of leprosy, there was really strong overlap. So this area that's shaded dark here, this is where all, or this is where the majority, I should say, of indigenous human cases of leprosy were found. It's also where all of the uh, positive armadillo samples were found. 
So there seemed to be this crescent along the Gulf Coast. Uh, lost my, oh, there it is. Uh, so from South Texas up into Louisiana, but along the Gulf Coast and then up along the Mississippi River a little bit, where leprosy seemed to be prevalent and it really wasn't found to any great degree anywhere else. So there was a lot of um, debate about why that might be the case. Some people proposed that it had to do with the, the soils that were found in those areas that would be kind of humid and might promote the survival of the bacterium outside of a host. Uh, that seemed like a logical possibility. But uh, getting back to what I said a moment ago, <clears throat> histopathology is not perfect because nerve damage only occurs in the later stages of disease. So you're getting animals that are already well into the progression of leprosy. You're not detecting animals that have just been recently exposed. So beginning in the 1980s, excuse me for just a second, I'm getting hoarse. But beginning in the 1980s, people developed a blood test where they looked for antibodies against the leprosy bacterium. And so that was referred to as a serology test. And so people really did kind of the same thing over again. You know, they went out and surveyed armadillos, this time not looking for ear samples where you could uh, look at nerve damage, but taking blood samples to look for antibodies against the leprae bacterium. And again, there's a lot of numbers here. Uh, this is where Colleen and I began to get involved with this. So we collected some of this data, uh, other people collected some other parts of it. But the main thing I want you to, to get from looking at this very big table is that you see that there's a lot more positive cases than there were from histopathology. And if you map that out, this is what you see, that unlike with the histopathological results where it was just along the Gulf Coast from here and then up along the Mississippi, you can see it's found other places as well. In fact, it's found all the way into Florida now, which with the earlier studies that had never been detected. So the upshot is that given the histopathology uh, results and the fact that they tested so many animals, with those results, they never detected any positive animals east of the Mississippi River. So all of these areas, basically zeros. But with the serology result, and especially the more recent serology results from some of the animals that we collected, it seems pretty clear. It's hard to believe that with the histopathological samples that they completely missed leprosy. If you're sampling thousands of animals, presumably you'd stumble across at least one or two that were positive. Uh, but the serology results suggest that leprosy is actually spreading across more of the southern U.S. than uh, it had been confined to in the past. So unlike uh, earlier where we thought it was just along the Gulf Coast and up along the Mississippi River, it seems to be other places as well. Now, the next thing to talk about a little bit would be the ecology of leprosy. This is the work that we did at the Yazoo National Wildlife Refuge. And so I'm gonna show you just a few things that we have discovered. The first concerns the demography of infection. Demography just refers to the age, age and sex distribution of positive animals. And there's a lot of numbers here. I debated whether to even put this up here because there are so many numbers. Let me just point out really two things. The first is that if you look at all the young animals, the yearling animals and the juvenile animals, juveniles would be young of the year, none of them ever tested positive for leprosy. So what that tells us or what that uh, suggests to us is that leprosy is something that's only found in adults and probably is not transmitted from parent to offspring or from adult to juvenile. Uh, if it is, it, uh, it seems to be extremely rare. 
But from what we can tell, there doesn't seem to be any vertical transmission of the infection. Now, as far as the adults go, I'm not gonna go through and try to compare all these numbers, but if you do the comparison, adult males and adult females are equally likely to be uh, positive, to be leprous. But among the females, lactating females are more likely to be leprous than non-lactating females. The reason for that seems to be related to the next point that I wanna make, which is on the next slide, which is that even among adults, the proportion of infected individuals increases with age. So the likelihood of being seropositive, of being positive for leprosy, increases the older you are. And getting back to the lactating female uh, issue, lactating females are older than non-lactating females. So it's probably an age effect. But this is just a graph to illustrate what I've just said, which is that if you look at the animals that we recaptured over the years at Yazoo, the longer that they persisted in the population, the more likely it was that they were going to test positive for leprosy. Now, the, the numbers get pretty small for the animals that survived in the population for a long, long time. But nonetheless, it seems pretty dramatic that for animals that we caught just once, the percentage of them that were positive was only about seven or eight percent. But for animals that were present for four or five years, the prevalence is nearly 50 percent. So the longer you stay in that population, the more likely it is that you're going to be exposed to leprosy. Now, as something else to consider, besides these demographic patterns, we can talk about temporal patterns. And there are just two things to mention here. Uh, we sampled armadillos every year from 2005 to 2010. And the prevalence of infection was not consistent. You can see that it fluctuated over time. So in 2005, we only had about uh, close to 5% of the animals were positive. But in 2010, it was way up at about uh, 15%. But it went up and down. There were some years where it went up a little bit, some years went, went down again, but it wasn't consistent. It didn't stay the same where you had a certain number of animals that were infected year after year after year. Some years it was higher, some years it was lower. Now, related to that would be if you found an animal that was infected or that tested positive for exposure to leprosy more accurately. You know, how long did they last? Did they just keel over and die immediately? Or just how long could, could an armadillo survive if it's tested positive for leprosy? Well, we found 77 positive animals over the course of our study. And 18% of them managed to make it to the following year. Only 5% of them managed to make it to two years beyond the initial test for being positive. And none of them managed to make it to four years beyond. So the bottom line on this is that if you're an armadillo that has tested positive for leprosy, your time is short. Uh, you might be able to survive another year or maybe two, but you're not going to last much longer, and so your days are numbered. Now, the final thing that I'll mention concerns the spatial distribution of infected animals. Let me take one more sip here. I mentioned before we take uh, GPS locations of every animal that we capture. That includes leprous and non-leprous animals. We tried all kinds of analyses to try and uh, examine whether there were spatial patterns in where infected animals were found in a population. We couldn't find any evidence of any sort of infection hotspot where you would get clusters of infected animals. Uh, this map is kind of hard to see, I realize. 
uh, the crosses, if you can see them, like the cross right here, cross here, these are the infected animals. The circles are the uninfected animals. If you do various kinds of analyses, you can do social network analyses, other kinds of spatial analyses, everything comes up negative. Infected animals, at least at Yazoo, were randomly distributed. Why that's the case, we can't explain yet, but they just seem to be located randomly within the population. Uh, beyond that, the final thing that I'll mention is that, well, you know, if you have these animals that are leprous and some that aren't, does being leprous matter? Does it impact the animals in any way? And the answer is, from what we could tell anyway, no. Uh, we couldn't find any differences in the body size of infected animals versus uninfected ones or in their behavior. Uh, there's tables show you a lot of numbers. You don't really need to worry about them a lot. It's just that if you compare the numbers between infected and uninfected, they're very, very similar. So there doesn't seem to be any major difference between animals that have been exposed to leprosy and animals that have not. So at this point, we're not clear whether there's any really serious consequences beyond longevity. We have done some population modeling. So like I said earlier, that uh, if you've got leprosy and you're an armadillo, your days are numbered. That doesn't uh, affect survivorship. So there is an impact from that, but during the time that a, a leprous armadillo is still alive, it seems to be the same size and do the same things as a non-leprous animal. So we don't see a lot of um, obvious consequences of leprosy infection, which is a bit surprising, especially given the fact that it elevates metabolic rate by about 20 some percent. You would think that would have consequences for for behavior and maybe for for body size measurements, but we we couldn't find anything. And so with that, I'm going to wrap things up by just uh, summarizing some of what I've told you. Uh, the first point to make is that leprosy seems to be a slow acting disease, and because it's slow acting, that means that it only really kind of manifests later in life, and so it is a disease that primarily affects older armadillos. From what we've been able to detect, there don't seem to be any major serious consequences of infection in wild populations. But from the biogeographical surveys that we've done, it is pretty clear, pretty evident that leprosy is spreading to other parts of the US exactly how far it will spread is something that uh, we're actually hoping to maybe look at starting next year. And then lastly, I didn't mention this too much uh, so far, except to say earlier that uh, we gave leprosy to armadillos and they have given it back. Uh, but uh, there is some pretty strong suggestive evidence of zoonotic transmission of leprosy from armadillos to humans, either from people who are hunting and eating armadillos and being exposed to the body fluids of an infected animal and contracting leprosy in that way. Or we've got uh, some data that suggests that leprosy can, or the leprosy bacterium can be found in uh, soils that have been contaminated by an infected armadillo, uh, probably from aerosol droplets from the nose. Uh, but contaminated soils and contact with those contaminated soils could be another way that humans uh, acquire leprosy from an armadillo. And so that's kind of the, the um, the state of play at the moment in terms of where we are in our understanding of leprosy and armadillos. And so with that, I will, I will show you this final slide because this obviously is the end. And so thank you for listening. I hope I didn't go too long.
uh, but I will be happy to answer any questions once I turn this back over to Kenny. Uh, all right, there you are. All right, thank you, Jim. That was wonderful. We very much appreciate you doing that for pretty much our first regularly occurring webinars. You did such a fantastic job that our YouTube subscription has more than doubled since the start of your talk. <laughs> there are only two to begin with, right? <laughs> over four right now. All right, well, I'll take credit for that. Yes. So uh, we actually have around 20 people who attended the first webinar, which is fantastic. If you have a question, please uh, type it into the chat box and I will read it to Jim. And Jim, we do have several comments and questions. The first is, um, I don't know if we said it out loud, but the title of this presentation is The Nine-Banded Armadillo, The Very Model of a Modern Major Mammal. And somebody says that is one of the most genius titles they have ever heard. Good. <laughs> we also I like it. I, I was very I was very pleased when I came up with that. <laughs> I actually debated whether I could uh, make the whole talk into light opera, but <laughs> A, I can't sing, that would be painful. And B, making everything rhyme, too much work. So maybe <laughs> another time, but yeah, light opera. Can, whenever you can work in some light opera, you ought to do it, right? You know, yes. so. <laughs> um, we also want, <laughs> One of the people who attended is Nick, and we want to thank him because he gave a shout out on Twitter, and he maybe directed people to us. Roxanne wants to know if you have any data on the difference between PGL1 and LID1 uh, positivity in samples from live armadillos versus dead armadillos. Um, did you say PG? PGL? Oh, PGL, PGL, yeah. Well, when they first developed the uh, antibody test, the only, well, um, to back up a little bit, this is sort of a technical thing, but antibodies react with antigens on the bacterium. And so the first antigen that they developed, in, uh, that they were testing uh, for an antibody against was the PGL1 antigen. And that was the only one that they had until uh, the mid 2000s, I guess. And then they developed a, a second one called LID1. Um, so in the initial surveys that we did, there was no possibility of, of comparing between the two because there was only the one test available. With the later stuff that we've done, uh, there are differences where you'll get an animal that tests positive for one and not for the other. But um, there's not enough of them so far anyway, where we could say anything about, um, you know, why there might be a difference in why, one an, why an animal would test positive for one versus the other. But there are two tests now. In some cases, you get a a positive result with both tests, but it's not unusual to get a positive with just one and not the other one. So. All right, very good. She also has a follow-up, but you also mentioned this briefly in your conclusion. Have you tested the armadillo burrows soil for the bacilli or antigen? Well, yeah. yeah, we did. Um, this is an unpublished study at this point. Uh, we're hoping to get it published fairly soon. But we went back to Yazoo and we sampled uh, burrows, random locations on the surface, and then also uh, little foraging pits where the animal was digging down into the soil uh, to find insects and presumably you know, breathing aerosol droplets into the soil. Uh, we took 150 soil samples. Approximately 20% of those came back positive. So we feel pretty confident that you can, you can detect uh, the leprosy bacterium in soil 
And this may be one of the, you know, uh, I mentioned that leprosy might be a zoonotic disease where armadillo is transmitted to humans, either through the uh, contact with the body fluids or contaminated soils, but it's still an open question how armadillos transmit it to other armadillos. And it could be from exposure to soils and burrows. Uh, it seems like the most likely possibility because armadillos are, are relatively solitary. They don't interact much. It's hard to envision how they could transmit the bacterium directly through some kind of contact, except during the breeding season and mating. So uh, exposure to contaminated soil seems like a, a, a pretty logical possibility, uh, but we need to do more with it. You know, I'm not willing to say that's a, a definite uh, means of transmission, but I think it's definitely worth uh, looking into more. So uh, Jim, can you see the comment section? Roxanne just did a follow-up. She said she meant the percentage positivity between dead and alive animals. Well, the dead would only be the road kills. And so they're not dying from leprosy. Uh, it's very rare that you find a dead armadillo in the wild. Uh, I think we found maybe two or three. So uh, we wouldn't have enough data to, to be able to say anything about that in a wild population. The only thing we could say is uh, live animals versus road kills, but road kills are clearly not being killed because of leprosy, at least don't think so. Uh, so, I think that's uh, an open question at this point. And then she also said that we have another armadillo species that are infected with M. leprae in French Guiana that will be published soon. Oh yeah, which one? Which species? Roxanne, feel free to type away. And- uh, Oh, Catherine, yeah. really? Well, that's that's exciting. It's It makes sense. I. I keep thinking that people are going to find leprosy in other species of armadillos, and so that's really interesting. Uh, I'm I'm going to look forward. If, if you can remember, maybe to send me that, uh, that'd be great. Or I will be looking for it uh, whenever it comes out because that's uh, that's really interesting. Maria says, Jim, thanks to you and Colleen for your interesting work. It has been fundamental to understand the ecology and evolution of this amazing group. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> we do yes. what we can, you know. We, uh, we just like doing it. So <laughs> it gave us something to do in the summer. So we were, we were happy with it. It's fairly easy. So Jessica wants to know is there a correlation between positive cases and low temperatures in that year? Uh, good question. Uh, I can't tell you. Uh, We've never looked at that. Um, I guess we could probably find the data. We, we could get the temperature data, but um, we have never looked at that. So we would have to go back and take a look. Do you think it would do anything? Would it I, have, I wouldn't want to say one or the other. Um, <laughs> there might be something there. Maybe not. Um, All right. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not going out on a limb on that one. No. Yeah. Jenny wants to know what's the life expectancy of a non leprous nine banded armadillo in the wild? Uh, short answer is nobody knows definitively. In captivity, they can live as long as 20 some years. But in the wild, from what we've been able to determine, sort of Unofficially, I would say longevity is probably around 10 to 12 years, something like that. That's pretty long for a small mammal. Uh, Nick says, I wanted to say thank you to Jim and Colleen for your book on armadillos. It's become my Bible for my own research <laughs> and writing stories. Um, so regarding taxonomy, there are lumpers and splitters. How does taxonomy relate to conservation? Well, it's, it's, it's critical because it determines your priorities in terms of what you're gonna conserve. Um, 
You know, for example, I mentioned that the uh, populations of nine band armadillos in the Guy uh, Guyana Shield in South America might be a separate species. Well, if they really are, then that's a fairly small population in a limited area. And they would probably be a target or a priority for conservation. Whereas if you know, uh, people decide, well, they're really just nine men and Everglades after all, uh, they would be a much lower priority. So uh, it's really crucial in, in determining what your priorities are for what you want to try and preserve. You know, ideally you want to preserve everything, but certainly you want to try and, and emphasize the, um, the rare or less common species uh, since they're more likely to go extinct. All right, Jim, we're almost out of time. I have two more questions. Uh, Roxanne wants to know, did you test other animals that use armadillo burrows? For leprosy? No, um, just be well, partly because they're hard to catch, uh, but also because there's never been any reports of them exhibiting leprosy. So, you know, if you could test possums or raccoons or things like that, uh, you could test them, but uh, whether you would find anything, the payoff from that seems relatively low. So, uh, no, we haven't done it. Um, there have been a lot of um, epidemiological studies of things like possums and raccoons where they screen them for all kinds of pathogens. So you would think if they, uh, if they were getting leprosy, somebody would have caught it uh, or, or detected it. And to my knowledge, nobody has. So I don't think it would be something that would uh, be likely to occur. So I want to thank everyone for attending our webinar. I put in the comment section our brand new YouTube page, as well as a link to the upcoming uh, specialist groups webinars. And then for a future teaser, Jim, evolutionary speaking, why is it good to have polyembryon? <laughs> I don't know if it's good or not. Um, or, or why has why that, has that trait uh, stayed with them? The answer to that question is good thirty minutes or maybe forty. Um, All right. But um, yeah, it's it's an interesting question. It was what got us interested in studying nine banded armadillos in the first place. Uh, if any of you guys are old enough to remember uh, Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene. Uh, in the 1976 first edition of that, he mentions nine-banded armadillos and the fact that they produce these identical quadruplets. And he says, you know, it'd be well worth somebody's while to go out to South America and study these things. Fortunately, you can, you don't have to go to South America, you can go to the U.S. But I remember reading that as a, uh, uh, a junior in college and thinking, man, somebody's going to have, have done that, you know, tomorrow. And uh, nobody did. We figured out why, because it's so difficult. Uh, but it was always surprising to me that nobody did. So when we finally got to Valdosta, we decided that we would try to do it. And um, so there is a long story there to be told about what happened with that. And we are looking forward to hearing it. <laughs> so we want to thank everyone. We are getting a string of uh, fantastic presentations. Thank you so much. I can't wait to, for more of these. Thank you for that. And uh, also, Roxanne also says, thank you very much. Your book is also her Bible. All right. Thank you, everyone. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Yeah, thank you. Well, Jim I enjoyed it. I hope everybody else did too. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye.